Hello and welcome to GameStack. This time around, we're talking about some more compilation discs. That's right. We've got some really good stuff here. A lot of stuff from Japan and even the USA. So this is going to be a good one to hang out for. Yeah, so sit back and, well, let's just get into it. Here's the Sega Smash Pack Volume 1 on the Sega Dreamcast. This amazing disc contains 12 games to play and was most often seen bundled with the system when you bought a Dreamcast. It includes 10 Genesis games such as Sonic the Hedgehog, Altered Beast, Golden Axe, The Revenge of Shinobi, Streets of Rage 2, Vector Man, Fantasy Star 2, Shining Force, Wrestle War, and yes, that's right, Columns. There's also two other games here which I'll get to in a bit. But first off, let's check out some of these classic Genesis games. It must have been great to have so many games on a single disc, especially back in the year 2000, right? Well, not really, because the emulation here is just awful. I mean, check out Sonic the Hedgehog. Tell me, does that look right to you? Most of the games look fine most of the time, but there's definitely some sprite priority issues that pop up here and there. And on Shining Force, you can see that the original image is not scaled very well to the Dreamcast resolution as there are nasty artifacts in the scrolling no matter which way the screen scrolls. But, you may ask, how does it sound? Well, here's how Altered Beast sounds like on a real Genesis. Welcome to your doom. Whoa, way cool, right? Well, here's how it sounds on the Smash Pack on the Dreamcast. Welcome to your doom. It sounds like a broke-ass master system that's been beaten with a baseball bat. You can tell that Sega didn't even care. At all. Each game has these same atrocities. What's even worse is that you just know that this disc was a lot of people's first experience playing any Genesis games at all. And to me, that is just scary. Anyway, before each game begins, you can remap the buttons on your controller, which is nice, but you have no idea what each button does in the game until you play it. During the gameplay, you can access the menu by pressing all four face buttons and start on the controller. This will let you exit to the main menu, and the two games with battery backup will let you save. This isn't a save state, it just writes what's ever in the game's backup RAM to the VMU, so be sure to do that. Included on this disc for the first time outside of Japan is Wrestle War. This is a port of a mediocre Sega arcade game where you do some wrestling. It's okay, but I'd really rather play it for the first time on a real console. Fortunately for me, I did because I had a store that rented Japanese Mega Drive games, but it's still a mediocre game. Also included is Sega Swirl. This is a legit Dreamcast game which was included on many demo discs and whatnot back in the day. It's a simple puzzle game where you try to clear the board of all the swirls in as few moves as possible. This is accomplished by moving the cursor and pressing the button, which causes a swirl and any light-colored swirls touching it to disappear. Of course, to score the highest points, you want to go for the biggest groups as possible. Even in single player, it's pretty damn fun, and I know for sure that I'm not the only one who likes this game. Lastly, Virtua Cop 2 is on the disc, and it can be played with a controller or a light gun like I'm using here. This is supposedly based on the PC version of the game. You're a cop and it's up to you to murder as many bad guys as possible and there sure are a hell of a lot of them. Don't bother calling for backup though, you've got this. You deal justice one bullet at a time. It plays exactly like the Saturn version, but everything has been improved. The graphics are now four times the resolution, jumping from 320 by 240 on the Saturn to 640 by 480 here. Yes, that's four times, not two times. The textures are also slightly better in this version, and it also features true transparency. The frame rate is still only 30 frames per second, but I'm betting the arcade version is the same way. The music is the same as the Saturn version, and it doesn't sound any better or worse, but the voices are much cleaner. Overall, this is the definitive home version of Virtua Cop 2 in my opinion, and that's what matters. I just wish that they had put the original House of the Dead on this disc instead of Virtua Cop 2. But then again, House of the Dead is probably not the best game to pack in with your video game system when you're trying to sell it to all age groups. Overall, the Sega Smash Pack Volume 1 is mostly bad with poor representations of great games, but it's worth having for Sega Swirl and Virtua Cop 2. And note, they never bothered with a Smash Pack Volume 2.
This is Midway Presents Arcade's Greatest Hits, the Atari Collection 2. How's that for a long title? I mean, geez, why so freaking long? Anyways, this was released in 1998 only for the PlayStation, and it includes six games. Paperboy, Gauntlet, Road Blasters, Crystal Castles, Marble Madness, and Millipede. So four very solid games, and two that I don't really care for, but whatever, somebody might like them. One game that I don't care for is Crystal Castles, which I actually played a lot when I was growing up. Nowadays, though, I just don't have any fun playing it. Millipede is the second game that really doesn't do anything for me. I mean, it's fun for a short while, and then I get bored of it very quickly. The other four games, though, I could play over and over, and you know what? I do. Gauntlet is the first one, and it's still very fun as long as you're not alone. That's because there's way too many enemies for your lone adventurer to handle, so it quickly gets frustrating. Luckily, the game supports the multi-tap for up to four players, which is when Gauntlet really shines. Road Blasters is another solid game that I played a bit when I was younger. There's something very appealing about driving and shooting other cars and collecting gas icons and other weapons. I was always enthralled with this game's smooth scaling, and it really holds up here on this release. You can control the game with the directional pad, but turning on the analog stick, that makes a huge difference. As you know, Marble Madness is one of my favorite arcade games ever. This was the main reason why I bought this disc back in the day. After playing the NES game for many years without the trackball, I got pretty good with the D-pad and would beat the game regularly. I figured that this version would be a walk in the park and I'd be able to beat it with the PlayStation's directional pad. And I was wrong because it's much more difficult here. The response time feels a bit sluggish and it's not easy to get used to. It takes a lot more tries for me to get anywhere in this version. I still haven't beaten it to this day, but I'm sure it can be done, and you know what? I'm definitely going to keep trying. My love for this game is so strong that I just want to keep playing and playing and playing. The last game on this disc is Paperboy. This is another title that I spent a lot of time with playing in the arcade. I was a Paperboy in real life, and it wasn't anywhere near as fun as this game. Trying to make it through the week without losing customers is a lot harder than you'd think. As you're pedaling your way down the street, you've got to avoid some crazy ass stuff. Cars, kids, breakdancers, zombies, people fighting, dogs, cats, and so much more. Even the Grim Reaper lives on your street. If you can avoid all that, then you ride through the training course at the end of the block for some extra points. You've got to get your paper on the subscriber's porch or in the mailbox, which will give you extra points. If you miss the porch or break a window, then they unsubscribe and their house becomes black. I love how they portray some of the unsubscriber's houses with gravestones and hearses and stuff like that. The game over screen is probably the best. It has a picture of you after you've fallen with one headline saying, he was a real loser. Huh, <laughs> gee, thanks. This is a solid arcade game that still holds up and is just as fun today as it was back in the 80s. Sadly, however, Paperboy will not work on a PlayStation 2. All of the other games will work fine, but Paperboy here flickers like crazy. But it will run fine on a PlayStation 1 and also a PlayStation 3. And if you look closely, you can see some strange scaling artifacts that make edges and also the text look really weird. We contacted Digital Eclipse, who developed this disc, and Mike Mika told us that this was a certain interlaced high-res mode of the PlayStation that they used. Evidently, it's a pretty rare mode, and Sony dropped support for it in the PS2 because somehow they were probably able to save a few pennies. The PS3 uses emulation for its backwards compatibility, so it's easier to support there. As far as the disc goes, there's not a lot extra here. You have a gallery of all the games which you can see pictures of arcade cabinets, the instruction manuals, and other artwork and paperwork. And these are fun to look at for about three minutes. Most of the games have an option for TV safe mode which fits everything on the screen. But there's also an arcade mode which keeps the game in its original format. This is still a good compilation of games that have had lots of fun playing over the years. Here's Namco Museum on the PlayStation Volumes 1 through 5. Nowadays, Namco Museums are everywhere on every platform, but it all started on the PlayStation here and it was a pretty big deal at the time. Each disc usually has six different Namco games, though Volume 1 here has seven with Pac-Man, Galaga, Pole Position, Bosconian, Rally X, New Rally X, and Toy Pop. Each disc also has a museum mode where you can wander through a polygonal space exploring items from the game's past. But yeah, you're probably only ever going to look at this stuff once. The games here aren't emulated, but rather ported to the PlayStation. But they're meant to mimic the arcade machines with similar boot-up sequences and the such. Some games, like Pac-Man, had to be completely redrawn to be presented on a horizontal screen. But each game also has an option that can be accessed by pressing the triangle button, but only if the game isn't currently being played. 
Here you can set various dip switches for game options in the game and also exit back to the main game selection menu. In vertical games, you can even select the vertical mode like the arcade. Or Tate for all you cool weebs out there. But you know, I'll always call it Tate. Because in this mode, you rotate your screen to play it properly. You don't rotate your screen. Oh, but it's a Japanese word, it's Tate! Still, having this option is always welcome. Pac-Man is a good game, but I probably spent most of my time in this volume with Galaga. This one just has a ridiculously addictive quality to it. Hell, even my girlfriend at the time played it a lot, too. In fact, she used to have the high score, but I'm kind of competitive that way. Yeah, I'm kind of an ass, but that's okay. Bosconian is another cool one. You get to fly around and blow up space stations that aren't doing anything to you. Die, you stupid space station! How dare you exist! There's even Rally X, which is kind of like Pac-Man, but with cars. And then there's New Rally X, which is kind of like Pac-Man, but with cars. And new! Volume 2 has Xevious, Gapless, Super Pac-Man, which you don't really see home ports of very often, Mappy, Grobda, and Dragon Buster. What's interesting is that all but one of these are vertically oriented games. This isn't the best volume, but I did find Grobda to be pretty fun trying to blow up all of the other tanks. Gapless is interesting as well. It's like Galaga, except you can move your ship vertically, and that feels really, really weird. However, you can also capture a bunch of enemies who will fight with you, and that's awesome. Mappy is here, and I guess a lot of people like that, but I've never really been able to get into it much, but it's here if you like it. Super Pac-Man tried to put a spin on the classic formula, and it's, it's fun for a few minutes, I guess. Dragon Buster is a sole horizontally oriented game here, and it's a silly dungeon crawling hack and slash, I guess you'd say. Not bad, but it's not amazing. Namco Museum Volume 3 has Galaxian, Miss Pac-Man, Pole Position 2, Dig Dug, this weird game called Fozon, and the Tower of Druaga. First of all, they cleaned up the menus and such in this game. Now you can call up the menu with triangle when you press pause to reset the game, and from there you can press triangle to select from the game's options such as the screen setting and whatnot. No more loading all the way back to the options screen than reloading the game. But when the game does load, it loads even faster than the first two volumes did. That makes getting around this disc much less painful. Anyway, I like this one mainly because of Miss Pac-Man. I feel it's way better than regular ass Pac-Man in every single way imaginable. Now, there may be some people who like the way the original works more because it's easier to score or predict patterns or whatever, but yeah, I don't care about that. Dig Dug is also one I had fun with in the arcade back in the day, so it's really nice to have it on here. Galaxian is cool, I guess, but it can never hope to match Galaga. Namco Museum 4 has some pretty big heavy hitters in my opinion with Assault, Pac-Land, Ordine, The Return of Ishtar, and the Genji and Haiki class. These aren't just rinky-dink games from the early 80s, most of these are pretty heavy 16-bit hitters. Pac-Land, as weird as it is, is a great game that features some fun platforming and button mashing. Basically, you've got to run through some stages and then run back through one of them. It takes a while to get used to, but I think I've finally grown to enjoy this game. When I first saw Assault in the arcades, it was the very first time that I saw rotation in any video game ever. I was totally blown away. I was like, whoa, that looks so cool. How'd they do that? Crazy. As a game, it's not amazing, but it's still fun to play. And come on, who wouldn't be impressed by Mode 7 back before there was Mode 7? It's just too bad that it doesn't support Sony's twin stick or even the DualShock analog. The Genji and the Haiki class is sure a dumb name for a game. In fact, it looks a hell of a lot like Samurai Ghost on the TurboGrafx-16. It's not the same game though, as this one has overhead stages and also stages where your character is much smaller. Still though, it's a really fun and interesting game and not something I'd expect to find here. Samurai Ghost is a way better name for sure. Ordine is a cool shooter that's a crap ton better in the arcade than it is on the TurboGrafx-16. Lots of cool rotation effects here and some great music. It's a fun shooter all around, actually. I spent a hell of a lot of time with this disc, and it's definitely one that I'm going to be coming back to often. Namco Museum Volume 5 is pretty nice for the most part. It has Pac-Mania, The Legend of Valkyrie, Dragon Spirit, Baraduke, and Metro Cross. Pac-Mania is a weird 3D isometric version of Pac-Man with a jump button. I don't know, it's not really my thing. Dragon Spirit is a good yet very unforgiving overhead shooter, but the excellent music is what's going to keep you coming back to this one. The Legend of Valkyrie is really cool. 
I remember playing this on the PC Engine, and of course, the arcade version here is so much better. I like the scaling backgrounds, the soundtrack, and the hack and slash gameplay is pretty good too. This is the standout game on the disc for me. Metro Cross is simple and kind of boring, but Borrowed Duke is a bit more fun. Namco Museum Encore was actually Volume 6 and was only released in Japan. This one featured seven games with Dragon Saber, Rompers, Wonder Momo, F this game by the way, Rolling Thunder, Sky Kid, Motos, and King in Balloon. Of course, Dragon Saber is an excellent follow-up to Dragon Spirit with some outstanding music. Rolling Thunder is another excellent game, and this and Dragon Saber are going to be where you're going to spend most of your time if you choose to import this. The other games on here are pretty much throwaway titles, though King and Balloon is kind of interesting. It's a Space Invaders clone where you have unlimited ships, but you need to prevent the king from getting kidnapped. If he's successfully stolen, you lose a life. And the little sounds that he makes are what makes this one so silly. Overall, the Namco museums on the PlayStation are a great set of discs. Though honestly, I would have preferred to see some games like Marvel Land, Burning Force, Felios, Outfoxies, and Splatterhouse to name just a few, rather than the likes of Sky Kid and Wonder Momo. Holy crap, Joe, I thought you'd never shut up. That was like the longest review ever. Is anybody still out there watching us? Well, I hope so, because we've got some more <laughs> stuff to talk about. Okay? Okay, let's, all right. Let's go. Here's Atari Anniversary Edition Redux for the PlayStation. Hey, they spelled it Redux, not me. This game was also released on the Dreamcast and the PC, but the PlayStation is a superior version in terms of games since it has more than the other two releases. This disc has 12 games from the early Atari days with Asteroids, Asteroids Deluxe, Battlezone, Black Widow, Centipede, Gravitar, Missile Command, Pong, Space Duel, Super Breakout, Tempest, and Warlords. This is a cool compilation because games in those days were all about lasting as long as you can and getting your initials on the high score list. Tempest is a great example of this. It was fun to go around each board killing everything that's trying to crawl out and then moving on to see what the next board looked like. Another thing I liked about this collection is that most of the games are displayed in vector graphics. There's something really cool about the blue vectors that holds a lot of memories of playing these games at my local putt-putt golf when I was a kid. I especially like Battlezone. My first memory is of the arcade cabinet and sticking my face into the same periscope that hundreds of other nasty people stuck their faces in before me. I loved piloting a tank in first person roaming the landscape blowing up other tanks. The arcade cabinet had two joysticks for tank controls. Playing this on the PlayStation, you can use the two analog sticks to simulate the controls and it actually works very well. It felt like it was back in the arcade minus the smell and loving it. <laughs> and I definitely used to be better than I am now, so don't judge, alright? Warlords is another game that I played a lot back in the day. In this one, you volley around Dragonfire trying to break down your opponent's castle walls and then destroy the core. The arcade cabinet had rotary paddles that were very precise controlling your shield. It's a completely different story on the PlayStation. The analog stick is way too sensitive which leaves you overshooting the incoming fireball that you're trying to deflect. The digital pad works better but is still very sluggish and is not very precise. It's a shame as this is otherwise a very fun game. Speaking of games that are impossible to control with the PlayStation pad, Super Breakout is another one. This one also used a paddle in the arcade and it was super precise. With the PlayStation pad, it is seriously unplayable. Same problem as before, the analog stick is way too sensitive and the digital pad is way too slow. Most of the other games are a bonus like Black Widow, which I've never played before. In this one, you're protecting your web from incoming enemies. The analog sticks were great for controlling your spider and it's fun shooting everything that gets in your way. And you can't go wrong with Asteroids, Asteroids Deluxe, Missile Command, and Centipede. These have all been played before by everyone, so no explanation is needed. I know they're fun and you know they're fun, and they all control really nicely with a PlayStation pad. As far as games like Pong, I admire it for its history, but damn, it's just really not fun to play nowadays. Each game on this disc has a few options that you can mess around with. All the games are formatted to be played on the PlayStation, so you won't need to turn your TV on its side for the arcade experience. But if you'd like, you can turn on the cabinet art for each game, which is cool, but ultimately I feel it gets in the way. 
As far as the emulation goes, I didn't notice any problems. The audio and video performed just like I remember in the arcades. Though Mike Mika from Digital Eclipse tells us that we might see some anomalies in some of the vector games that used only the R, G, and B components based on the standard TV arrangement. It should look good on most TVs, but might look bad in captures and emulation. How do you think these captures look? Besides the games, there's a few other things contained on this disc. If you're interested, there's a big interview with Nolan Bushnell that may or may not reveal something that you don't know about Atari. Then, of course, there's the usual gallery of pics of arcade cabinets and flyers and other cool Atari stuff. I paid a whole $3 for this disc and I feel that I got my money's worth. If you like older Atari arcade games, this is a good compilation to have despite some of the control issues. Here's the Capcom Generation series of compilation discs. These were released on the Saturn and the PlayStation, and I'm playing them on the Saturn here. But the PlayStation versions are actually better, more on that later. Unlike Namco, Capcom rarely put more than three games on each disc, and most of these discs were not released in North America. Capcom Generation 1 has 1942, 1943, and 1943 Kai. I could never really get into the 1940 series of shooters, especially the first one with its hideous whistle soundtrack. 1943 improved things a lot with smoother control, slightly better gameplay, and actual music to listen to. 1943 Kai plays just like 1943 with a fresh new coat of paint both in visuals and in music. Not really sure why they made this one, but whatever, here it is. It's too bad that the best 1940s game, 1941 Counter-Attack, is nowhere to be found here. Each game lets you play it on a horizontally oriented screen or vertically like the actual arcade game. And of course, I'm playing them all vertically here. Why? Because I love you guys with all my heart. Well, most of it anyway. Switching games is easy at the title screens and you can get back to them quickly by pressing A, B, C and start just like any other Saturn game. Each game also has a collection that shows off artwork for the series, drawings, tips and may even have some arranged music to listen to. Capcom Generation 2 is definitely my favorite. It's got Ghosts and Goblins, Ghouls and Ghosts and Super Ghouls and Ghosts. The original Ghosts and Goblins is a cool game, but I never played it until after I had already played Ghouls and Ghosts, so this one kind of feels sloppy and broken to me. Still, it's fun to see where it all started. Of course, Ghouls and Ghosts is the standout title here, being the last game in the series to ever appear in an arcade. The port here is mostly pretty good. There are a few very minor graphical differences, the sound effects are a bit muffled, and there's even the occasional bug. Still, this was as close as I felt I could get to the arcade in the home back in 1998, so of course I bought it when it was released in Japan. This is such a fantastic game, and everything else on the disc is just an added bonus. And it's Ghouls and Ghosts, so yes, of course I beat it. I mean, this game is almost impossible not to beat. Super Ghouls and Ghosts is also on here despite never being an arcade game. Thanks to everyone slapping the word Super on everything back then, a lot of people just figured that this is the Super Nintendo version of the Genesis game, even to this day. I see a ton of confusion about this on the internet. So let it be known that this is the sequel to Ghouls and Ghosts. It's definitely a much slower paced game and you can no longer shoot upwards. In fact, it even has more slowdown than the Super Nintendo game. Still, this is a fantastic game and who doesn't love double jumping? Capcom Generation 3 features some pretty unremarkable games. It's got Volgus, Sun Sun, Pirate Ship Higamaru, and x Xs. These are really only noteworthy because they were some of Capcom's very first games. One thing that's interesting is that each game offers the option to play with the original music or remixed music. There's definitely some fun to be had here though, and it's pretty simple fun. Things definitely improved for Capcom Generation 4. This one has the original Commando, Commando 2, also known as Mercs, and Gunsmoke, or Gun.Smoke. With Commando, it was fun to see what really boosted the overhead run and gun genre into the spotlight. It's still hard as balls though. Mercs is the standout title on the disc. There's lots of different areas to fight through, different weapons to collect, and even different vehicles and things to commandeer. No longer do you need to be satisfied with a single player version on the Genesis. If you know two other people who like video games, they can play too, at the same time. The stages are short, but otherwise this one is fantastic. Having Gunsmoke on here is nice, I guess, but I'll always prefer the NES version. Seriously, the NES version is so much better, you might not even want to bother with this one. Again, the remixed music is here, but there's only a couple of themes from each game that were remixed. 
Lastly, Capcom Generation 5 is a huge disappointment. All it has is Street Fighter 2, Street Fighter 2 Champion Edition, and Street Fighter 2 Turbo. It's really just one game on this disc with minor differences. The world didn't need any more Street Fighter back then, and there are so many other games that could have been on here instead. Also, I don't know if it's just me, but each game here feels overwhelmingly unbalanced to the point of being unplayable. Overall, Capcom really screwed the pooch with their Generation series. It has a few good games and a bunch of throwaway stuff that nobody cares about. There are so many other great games made by Capcom that could have been on here. And I wholeheartedly recommend the PlayStation versions over the Saturn ones because the PlayStation version can handle the different resolutions a lot better with both the vertical and the horizontal games. The PlayStation has an exact match for each resolution that Capcom uses, whereas the Saturn doesn't. So on the Saturn versions, you're either going to get black bars on the low resolution games or edges clipped off on the higher resolution games. The exception is Capcom Generation 2 because Ghouls and Ghosts on the PlayStation is way, way too dark. In fact, this game on the Xbox compilation has the same issue. What the hell, Capcom? These were interesting back in the day, but I wish they would have done it as well as Namco did. Arcade Party Pack by Midway is another PlayStation exclusive that was released in 1999. This one has six games including 720, Clax, Rampage, Smash TV, Super Sprint, and Tubin. Let's get the crap out of the way first. Clax is a puzzle game that I've never been able to enjoy. Colored blocks are coming at you, and as is the norm, you must match three colors to make them disappear. That's all you do and it's really boring. If you like this game, then I'm happy for you, but you know, I find no enjoyment in it. Rampage is a second game that I just don't care for. This is probably a surprise since it's a fairly popular game. I mean, it's got a great premise. You're a huge monster that's been infected and you smash down buildings and kill people in the process. Sounds like it should be fun, but I don't know what it is. I just get bored of it very quickly. Okay, enough of that. Now let's move on to the fun stuff. 720, or as a lot of people like to call it, 720 Degrees is a skateboarding game. I played this game like crazy in the 80s. You have a small overworld that you're skating on and you do tricks off of launch ramps and other things to get money and points. Once you have enough points, you skate to one of four contests and enter it. This sounds easy, but you have a very limited time to earn points. As time runs out, a voice comes on and tells you to skate or die, and of course at this point a swarm of bees chases you. You can dodge them for a little while, but ultimately they're going to catch you. And of course it controls fine on the original PlayStation. Smash TV is another awesome game. As you know, you're part of a TV show going from room to room trying to survive waves of people and bots that want to end your life. As if that's not bad enough, you're also trying to collect awesome presents like VCRs and roadsters and stuff to up your score. There's lots of cool weapons and big bosses. In my opinion, this is the best game on the compilation. And this game uses both the analog sticks and it works great, just like the arcade. Next up is Tubin. This game lets you ride an inner tube down a river while trying to avoid the many perils that pollute it. Your inner tube is fragile, so even small sticks and branches will pop it. Of course, you can collect soda cans to use as weapons to clear your path and to stun all the nasty humans and animals that are also trying to stop you from having a good float. This one took a while to grow on me, but it has and it's a really fun game to play. And finally, Super Sprint is an overhead racing game that pits you against three other racers. I always love these kinds of racing games and this one is definitely fun to play. I like it because of the variety in tracks. There's so many different designs and they're all really fun to race on. Not only that, but some tracks have doors that open and close which can help you shave off a few seconds and give you a bigger lead. But of course, they can also give your enemies a chance to catch up or even take the lead from you. I've had a lot of fun with this game and it never gets dull. The control is a bit touchy, but overall it works good and you just have to finesse the gas and steering to try and make a clean run. So what's on this disc besides these games? Well, each game has an interview with the game's designer that again might enlighten you with some new information. And of course, you can set the video format for each game to arcade or TV safe mode. The biggest problem that I encountered is the same one with Paperboy. 720, Super Sprint, and Tubin won't play on a PlayStation 2 at all, but the other three games work fine. But these three games will work on the original PlayStation and of course the PlayStation 3. Super Sprint and Tubin look completely normal, but not so for 720. Any type of text that you see will look garbled with vertical combing like I showed you on Paperboy. The game plays fine, but it's pretty damn annoying when you can barely read anything. 
Anyway, this is still a fun disc and I love the majority of it, so I'd recommend that you buy and enjoy it yourself. All right, there you go. Some more compilation discs. In fact, a whole hell of a lot more compilation discs. <laughs> a whole hell of a lot more. But I imagine there's got to be more out there. You guys, let us know if there's any more out there that you think are worthy of talking about or worthy of us playing, and we'll take a look at them. And in the meantime, thank you for watching Game Set. The Namco Museum. Absolutely, I've got the full set. That means I'm actually better than you at something. Where's the T? There's no T in Namco, idiot. Dude, are you serious? Look, Namco, right there. There's a T, and you're missing that disc. It has all of Namco Tokyo's home division games on it. You are really an incompletionist. But don't worry, Joe. I burnt you a disc with all those home division games on it. Yeah, you're welcome.